of a dance today. It's appropriate to come into the Lord's presence with uh, thanksgiving, with dancing, and we can do that. I will celebrate, sing unto the Lord. I will sing to Him a new song. I will celebrate, sing unto the Lord. I with our needs Lord but we come to you who is able we come to the almighty king of the universe the creator of all things you said that nothing is too difficult for you and so we come to you yes with praise knowing that you we have your ear knowing that you answer when we call and we pray Lord that your spirit would be Please today as we worship you, Lord, that you would feel welcomed here as we look to you, almighty God. We give you praise and worship. You are an awesome God, the one who is to be 
focused on. You, O oh Lord, are the center, O oh Lord. We praise you, God. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Blessed be the name of the Lord. You are worthy to be praised and adored. So we lift up holy hands in one accord. Sing, blessed be the name. Blessed. Thank you. 
name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You are worthy to be praised and adored. So we lift up holy hands in one accord. Singing, blessed be the name. Blessed. wonder why we're singing just a few words over and over in an attitude of worship. Well, if you're wondering why we already sang those words, why do you keep repeating that? You see, in heaven, before the throne of God, eternity, there will be angels and the hosts of heaven and many of the saints will be saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We will be repeating the praises of God to our Father in heaven, and we will be able to see the one who was slain, who has made us worthy because of his blood to come into his presence and sing. We have an audience of one. Jesus, the risen one, hears your praises. The Father in heaven rejoices over you with singing. I don't know what that sounds like, but I can't wait to hear it. There'll come a day when all pain will be gone. Everything that vies for your attention down here that seems so big will be not even a distant memory for the former things will be passed away. And we will remember the pain no more. For Jesus said he himself will wipe away every tear from your eye. And there will be no more sighing, crying, no more death. But we will be singing to the maker of heaven. Holy, you are holy. King of kings, Lord of lords, you are holy. Even now you reign. Even now you reign. Hallelujah, Lord.
Stay in the presence of the Lord. Worship Him softly. Raise your own song, your voice as an instrument. And if you have a word, then speak it out. church family. I just have a, something to share. Um, I'll make it quick. But um, I was on a walk the other day, and I, I'm not really sure what I was doing while on the walk, but I, I think I was listening to a message or something on a podcast, and I, it just popped into my head. I think the teacher mentioned the instance of uh, Paul and Silas when they're praising in the prison and then the there's an earthquake and the prison just like completely breaks down right and then the prison guard comes in and realizing in, like in his mind he's like I'm a dead man because clearly they're all gone right like they're out of here and so he goes to kill himself and then Paul, uh, Paul's like don't kill yourself you know we're all here still and I, the Holy Spirit just like revealed to me how if that were me in that situation, I'm in a prison, I've just been flogged, right? I'm bound and I'm singing and the prison breaks down. What am I doing? I'm out of there, right? I'm like, thank you, Lord, for that deliverance. Peace. And... I'm like, but Paul, Paul and Silas stayed. They didn't run. They didn't accept that as like God's mighty deliverance of them because it was all about them and being free, right? No, they, they stayed because of the gospel's sake. They thought of the prisoner, they, or the prison keeper and his family. They knew what would come if they left, right? And they stayed so that salvation would come to his house. Like... Lord, let that be my mindset. And that's all I got. God is so good. That's a perfect uh, prelude into what he put on my heart this morning. Um, have you ever had a, a day where you get up and you've had something that you're praying for and praying through and just looking for God to be doing something, and you're to a point where you're just crying out, and you're saying, God, show me something. You know, and it's not like he has to show me something. He's done everything he ever needs to do, and we, we know that. But my heart this morning was just in a place, and you know, and it could be, it could be whether it's a, a, a marriage situation or a child who's wayward or, or a job situation or whatever it is, that is on our heart, that's, that's burdening our heart, that's breaking our heart. So that this morning I was sitting, my, my journal was open in front of me, and I was just crying out. I couldn't even think of right and I'm just, what to write, and I'm crying out, God, I know you've, you've done everything that you need to do for me, but please show me something in this particular situation is about a, a, a son who's way off the reservation. And I know that there are plenty of you out there who, who understand what I'm talking about. And so this morning as I cried out to him, and in the past I've done this and God has shown me very tangible things and it just lifted my heart. And it was a little different way this morning. He, I opened up, I just thought to reach forward and I, and I got, grabbed a devotional that I've been reading through. And I want to share uh, what he spoke to me through this devotional. When the Word of God repeats a certain pair of sentences over and over, maybe we should take note, especially if those words tend to bring an outpouring of God's power and glory into earthly circumstances when uttered by God's people. These two sentences make up today's key verse. 
One of them is, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercies endure forever. We see the first record appear, appearance of, this, of these extraordinary words in 1 Chronicles 16 in a song penned by King David to celebrate the bringing of the ark, ark of the covenant and therefore the presence of God back to the center of Israelite life. At the climax of a long, exuberant hymn of praise, David, the extraordinary lyricist, sings them out. On several other occasions in biblical narrative, the unified saying or singing of these words by a group of people has accomp was accompanied by either a miraculous victory or a tangible manifestation of God's presence and power or both. For example, in 2 Chronicles 5, the singing of these special words resulted in the very glory of God himself filling the room and, come, and becoming so intense that no one present could even stand on their feet. In the 20th chapter of the same book, we see the Israelites going out into battle to face an overwhelmingly superior enemy. The army is led by the worshippers singing David's powerful lyrics. Suddenly, the army... The enemy's army becomes confused and they turn on each other. The attackers are destroyed without a single Israelite sword being unsheathed. These words repeatedly appear in the Psalms of David and one of Jeremiah's prophecies. They may very well be the most repeated phrases in all the Bible. Why are they so obviously important and so clearly powerful? Why do these phrases unleash heaven's power on earth? It's not the words themselves. It's God's people giving voice and faith and adoration to the truths that certain, the truths they, they contain that release power and glory. These declarations weave a mighty cord of three strands, a heart of gratitude, an affirmation of God's goodness, and a reminder that God's love is co covenantal and therefore relentless. When you contemplate the truth of that, an utterly good good God's love is tenacious and unmoved by our frailties, our flaws, and wavering faithfulness. Your heart has only, to, has only one rational response to cry, and that is, thank you. You are good, and your love can't be stopped. And once we give voice to that hymn of praise and faith, it rends the very fabric, separating heaven from earth, allowing glory and power to pour down on your circumstances. God is so good. God didn't show me a tangible move of something in, in my son's heart or in his life, but he brought himself down this morning. He reached down with his hand and he said to me, my son, remember me. Remember who I am. Remember what I can do. And remember how loved you are always. And so I want to encourage anyone who's in that place, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. We're going to continue praising, and you have an opportunity to sing with us.
start off looking in uh, John chapter 6. And I find this uh, chapter fascinating uh, because we start off where Jesus uh, feeds 5,000 people. You know, people come to him, he teaches them, and there's no food. So he's like, I'll give you food. So out of, you know, just a few things, he feeds 5,000 people. So that gets them all excited. People are like, this guy is amazing. You know, I'm going to follow him. The next morning, they wake up and Jesus is gone. And what's incredible about this is the boat that um, had already left the day before and Jesus was not on it, but Jesus is now on the other side of the lake. So they realize Jesus must have walked across the water. And so they're all like, you know, this has to be, you know, the Messiah. We're going to follow him. You know, they're excited. They're like, go Jesus. And so they go across the lake and they finally find him the next day and he starts teaching them. And what happens, that excitement dwindles. It goes away. Because Jesus basically explains the cost of following him. And I would imagine if Jesus had like a marketing director or social media person, you know, they would have told him to do something different. You know, don't lose all these, these thousands of people that are following you. You know, stick with what's luring them in. You know, give them the stuff that they want, the, the feeding them with out of like just a, a lunchbox. You know, show them how you can walk on water. But the thing that Jesus wanted to do was to teach them, to show them what it cost to follow him. Amen. And people left. And I feel like that's very similar to what, what many of us are doing today. We're all excited when we read about, in the Bible about the blessings that God has to offer. 
You know, we're excited about how God answers prayer, how he can give peace, how he can give joy. You know, we love those things because they're true. That is what God wants to do. That is what Jesus wants to bring into our lives. But then when we start talking about the cost of following him, we tend to lose interest. And we start talking about things like, oh, oh now, you, now you're sounding legalistic. You know, now, now you're just kind of like getting into like the do's and don'ts and, and, and that's, not, that's not what it's supposed to be about, you know? But what we have to understand is that there is a cost to following Jesus. And, and that cost is something that we need to understand and understand that this is what God is desiring of us. You see, we can't ask for the blessing and then turn away when it's something that we don't agree with. When it doesn't fit how we want to live our lives. You see, I want to have fun. And this thing that I'm now reading in the Bible, that doesn't really seem to fit how I want to live my life. So I'm just going to dismiss that. And I'm going to put on my wall at home things about the joy that you're going to bring. I'm going to put on my wall about how you're going to answer prayers. But I'm not going to really focus on what's required of me. We want to get from God but too often we're not interested in what we need to give to God. And that's somewhat what we're going to talk about today. You see, when Jesus in John 6, uh, 67, after they were leaving, Jesus turned to his disciples and said, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. And, and I love this verse because Jesus is like firm. Now, I don't think Jesus at all was like, I don't care if these people leave. Jesus loves these people dearly. He desperately wanted them to follow him. You know, he desperately wanted them to say like, you know, I, I accept the cost. I'm willing to pay the, the, the price to follow you. But they didn't. And I think with a broken heart, Jesus is like, what about you guys? But we have to understand the one thing Jesus will not do is lower the standard. Amen. Just because a whole bunch of people are leaving, that they're not willing to pay the price to, to lay down their lives, Jesus is not going to say, oh, oh, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't, don't, don't walk away. I'll change the standard. That's not going to happen. There is a standard that Jesus is looking for. And, and so he turns to his disciples and say, are you guys leaving too? And Peter in 68 and 69 says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. And so this got me thinking, where do we go? You know, Jesus is saying, do you want to leave too? Are there things in our lives that we go to instead of following Jesus? And I think that the, the list could go on and on. Some of the things I wrote down is like work. You know, we go to, to our work, we, we invest all of ourselves into our jobs and, and making ourselves something to, to seek after that promotion above all else, you know, and, and closely linked to that is making money. You know, if I could just make more money, if I can just put a, more time into my job to make money, if I can just figure out more ways to get money, or maybe it can be family or friends, or entertainment, or sports, or music, or shopping, or social media, and, and it can go on and on and on. All of these things are things that we go to instead of Jesus. And we need to be aware of in, in our lives that Jesus is the one that we need to go to Amen. every day, all day long. And the Bible is very clear about the place that uh, God wants to play in our lives. In Matthew 22, 37, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. <clears throat> Everything about us is to love the Lord. He is to be first in our lives. And yet, I can't get this question that Jesus asked out of my mind. You do not want to leave too, do you? Because I think we go too often. There was um, a few, a while ago, Rachel and I went to um, a buffet. And I was excited because, you know, they have all these different tables of food that I, I like. 
And when I, we, get, we, we went to the restaurant, they sat us down, and I got up, and I was, I was going to go to the, the, the food that I liked. And I was a little bit offended, okay? And I know offense isn't right, but I think you're going to agree me that it was appropriate for me in this situation. Be, why are you laughing? Why is that funny? <laughs> I don't get this. You're, like, laughing already. I'm, like, pouring out my heart. But you see, the first table that I ran into was the salad bar. That was offensive, you see, <laughs> because I was not looking at salad, you know, but yet it's like this glaring reminder, like, eat healthy. You know, it's like you hear them, your mom in the back of your mind, even at my age, like, no, you should have your fruits and vegetables, but that wasn't what I went there for, you see, and, and as I was looking at kind of this message, what I realized is like, that's a lot of how we go about our spiritual life. You know, we, we are wanting what we know we want. We want the blessings. We want the good stuff in the Bible. And we're trying to avoid the things that we really don't want to talk about. And we try to, like, push those aside and just be like, oh, oh I don't want to see that. You know, kind of like me seeing the salad bar. I didn't want to see it. I didn't think it was appropriate for a restaurant to have it. Okay. <laughs> Because who wants that, you know? People, the only reason they get salad is because of guilt, right? And so, but you see, in our faith, that's not the route that we can take. You know, we need to take all that God has to offer. The Bible is not a buffet. You know, it's not a pick or choose what it is that you want to take in your relationship with God. So we're going to take a look in Revelation chapter 3 at the church of La- uh, Laodicea. And in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, uh, Jesus addresses seven different churches. And it's kind of like, you could say, like an evaluation of these churches. What are they doing good? What do they need to improve at? And, you know, some encouraging things at the end. The church of Laodicea has nothing that they're doing good. You know, most of them, Jesus is like, you're doing such and such pretty good. You know, keep at it. Do good with that. And these are the areas you need to work at. Laodicea, it's like, I got nothing for you, that, you know, positive that, you can, that I can really talk about. You know, it's just, we, need a, we have a lot of work to do. And so uh, Jesus gets right into it. In chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, he says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Now this is one of the probably most commonly misunderstood uh, verses in the Bible. Because a lot of times we look at this as like being hot would mean like you're excited and you're on fire for God. You know, you're, you're just like a, a strong believer in Jesus. And a lot of times we think cold would mean like you don't believe at all in, in God. You know, like an atheist or something like that. And then lukewarm is bad because you're trying to ride the fence. That's actually not the situation in this uh, verse. Because the way that water was dealt with back then is both cold water and hot water were good. Both of those were good. What was kind of useless was the lukewarm water. Okay? And so what God is saying is, he wasn't saying like you're in the middle between good and bad. He was just saying you're kind of like pointless, useless. You're not doing anything. They had no passion for God. They weren't serving him with, with all of their heart. You know, they were, they were distracted by all the other things that they, that they wanted to do. You know, be hot, be cold. Both are good. Both are useful to people. But you're just lukewarm. And so when we look at like our church today, are you useful for the kingdom of God? Is Christ your passion? You know, when you woke up today, is that what you woke up to do? To serve God. God's kingdom was on your mind from the time you got up. Or are you lukewarm? You're not hot. You're not cold. You're not fighting for the kingdom of God. You're just kind of there. You know, And and so what God is saying is, Be hot or cold. Be useful for the kingdom of God. You know, don't just kind of blend in and and not make a difference for my kingdom. And so then we get into the the issue that they're having. Because, you know, 
you got to love that Jesus doesn't really mince words. He's like right in the middle. You're lukewarm. You're not useful for this kingdom. You know, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Here's the problem. In uh, verse 17, it says, uh, You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Okay? Now, let's break this down here for a second. If you were to come in here and say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, is this a problem? No. There's a lot of people in the Bible that were wealthy. You know, if, if you have wealth, if you've acquired wealth, and you're using that for the, the glory of God, and, and you're, you know, using it to minister for his kingdom, it's great to be wealthy. You know, David was immensely wealthy in the Old Testament. He was a man after God's own heart. So we don't have a problem with this statement. I am rich, I have acquired wealth. That's good. But here's the problem. I do not need a thing. That was the problem with the church of Laodicea. They thought they were self-sufficient. They had it. They didn't need anything. They were a wealthy city. They, were, they, had, they had the money coming in. They had the status. They had everything in those days that they could, they could need. Does that sound like any other nation that you might know of, like our nation. How many of us go through life thinking, I'm good, I don't need anything. But the things that we need aren't really needs, they're wants. And what we want is more pleasure from the world. You see, that's why the Church of Laodicea, I believe, is so similar to our country today. Because we chase after the wrong thing. And we put our security and our passions into the things of this world. I, you know, too often we go through life and think, yeah, I'm good, I'm great, I'm secure. Because I have money in the bank. You know, I'm good, I'm great. I don't need anything because I have a stable job. Because my family, they, they're doing good. Everybody's healthy. Everybody's happy. I'm doing good. And sometimes we, we view God and prayer and reading the Bible as some type of 911 call. We like to know it's there so that when I need it, I'll go to it. But if I don't need it, I'm just going to enjoy the pleasures of this world. That is how so many in the church in America... I think, are living their lives. And you see what Jesus is saying, and Jesus is, is putting a direct link to this phrase, I do not need a thing, with wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You see, Jesus didn't go into this long list of these horrible sins that the church of Laodicea was doing. Remember, there was nothing that Jesus mentioned that they did well. He only had, like, like, problems with this church. The only thing that he, that he mentioned that they had a problem with, they acted like they didn't need him. That is a serious issue to Jesus. Because Jesus is something that we all need. Amen. And we are not in a position to be like, a call when I need you. That is not a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, we have a tendency in, in our country to look at people that are like wealthy or, or smart or, or, I don't know, beautiful or, you know, athletic or something, we put them up on this pedestal and we're like, boy, that would be great to be like that. You know, that'd be great to be like, you know, super smart and be able to figure out all these things or, or I'd love to be able to like be this amazing athlete and, and you know, be well known and, or be famous. And we, we, we elevate these people in our mind. They're the ones that fill our, the headlines and that we all want to be at. But what if this verse is how we lived our lives? What if we view things not like people usually do, but what if we view things the way that God viewed things? You know, what if we looked at those that were like famous but didn't know Jesus and it broke our heart? You know, we so often have, we know these like commercials 
where they show the children that are in need, you know, that are looking for sponsors. And, and I don't know, some of you may have even might cry at these commercials, as you should. It should, it should break your heart. You know, it, it's sad when, when people don't have food or, or things like that. But what if we also had that same reaction where we, we felt bad and our heart broke and, and we just felt like, you know, these poor, poor people at the Super Bowl? Because there's probably people in that picture right there that don't know Jesus. Amen. What if that is what broke our hearts? You know, the, the things that are fam- the Grammys or the, you know, the Emmys or, or what, what if we, in those shows, our hearts broke? What if tears came to our eyes when we saw these people because they didn't know Jesus? And what if we saw people that were, like, struggling, but they had, like, this incredible faith, and we just felt like, wow, that's awesome. And that's the person that we elevated, that we're like, man, I want to be like that person, because they have this faith in God. Look at, they hardly have anything, but they have joy, and they have peace, and they have everything that they need because of their relationship with Jesus Christ, and they have nothing in this world but everything in eternity. And what if that's the person that's like, I want to be like them. And we looked at these people and we're like, oh man, those poor people. What if we viewed things like God viewed things? Would our attitude, would our thoughts be different? You know, and that's what we need to focus on today as we look at this church of Laodicea. Are we seeing things the same way that God sees things? Uh, Jim Kelly, um, he was a quarterback of the Buffalo Bills in mostly the uh, 90s. And, um, or was it the 80s? I don't know, 80s, 90s, anyways, what does it matter, right? Um, Anyways, he was very famous. Um, He, you know, led the Buffalo Bills to four straight Super Bowls. Um, He was in the Hall of Fame in 2002. He threw for over 35,000 yards, over 200 touchdowns, five Pro Bowls, all this kind of stuff. Do you think anybody had the poster of him in their room? Probably. Probably a bunch of kids. You know, they were like, I want to grow up to be like him because he was famous. He had everything. Wealth, talent, you know, going to Super Bowls, all this kind of stuff. So in 2005, he had a young son that passed away. And he spoke about how angry and lost he was for such a long time. And just recently, this happened. He was baptized. Okay? He came to a point in his life where he realized what he had before was nothing. And this is what he said. All I know is that God changed my life. After Hunter, who was his son, went to heaven... I was so lost and angry at God, but God loved me anyway, and he never gave up on me. I'm far from perfect, but God helped me humble myself and seek him for help. Becoming a Christian is the best decision I've made in my life. I wish I would have come to him sooner, but his timing is perfect. That's what it's all about. He, he realized it's not the fame. It's not the money. It's not all of the things that he had. He was like on top. But he realized it was nothing. Do we truly realize that today? Or do we keep striving and striving and striving and striving, but we're striving after nothing? We're striving after things that don't matter. Or maybe it's just the pleasures and the entertainment of life. You know, we wake up in the morning and it's like, oh, I want to do this and I want to do that and I want to do all these different things. But none of it is about God. We're chasing after things that are going to leave you empty. Because he came to a point in his life where he's like, I'm lost. All that I accomplished means nothing in my situation right now. We all need Jesus. It is so simple, yet so often we miss it. That in our lives, this needs to be the cry of our heart every single day. I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you. When everything is going great, 
When everything is going smooth in your life, I need you, Jesus. I can't do this on my own. You know, one of the reasons why I like honestly speaking is because it's like I feel so much like I need Jesus. You know, it's such a humbling, like, you know, I can't do this on my own. You know, I, I don't know if it's my personality or what, but this is not my comfort zone. I have to have Jesus to be able to stand in front of you today. You know, and, and it's like, but that's how I want to feel when I go to work tomorrow as well. That's how I want to feel when I play with my daughters tomorrow night. You know, everything that I do, I cannot do it to the best of my ability, to the way that God wants me to, unless I realize I need him. That I do not want to take another breath. I do not want to do another thing in my life without him. I need him for everything. <clears throat> it's so easy in this world to run after other things. You know, to think that the things that we need or we want are what's going to fill us. And we chase them and chase them and chase them. When all, the whole time we simply need to be like Peter and says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You know, there's a lot of things that can pull us away from, uh, from Jesus. You know, we have this whole world. I mean, goodness, with the internet and TV and, and so much stuff. I mean, you drive down the road and there's just entertainment, entertainment, entertainment. You know, and it, it's so easy to get pulled away from where our eyes and our, and our hearts need to be focused on. But all that we, we, we need to do is to be like Peter, who's like, I don't even see where I would go. That when we wake up tomorrow morning, we would honestly be like, if I wasn't going to go to the Lord... Where would I go? Amen. That's where God wants us to be. In uh, 1 Timothy 6, 9, it says, Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. That's, that's what a lot of people honestly have experienced. You know, they're chasing after riches, and, and it, it's just a trap. It's just this temptation that's going to that's gonna lead them into destruction and, and all these things that they don't want to get into. But what I honestly think, and, and not that I want to change scripture, but I think we could move, switch things out of that get rich to whatever it is that's pulling you away from Jesus. You know, what are you pulling, being pulled away by? Is it being noticed or being Im impressed or having people be impressed by you? You know, those who want to impress others fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. What is it that's pulling you away? Whatever it may be, being noticed, being, uh, spending your time on your hobbies, chasing after worldly pleasures, spending too much time on social media, all of those can lead you into temptation and a trap that will lead to many harmful desires that plunge you into ruin and destruction. Because here's the bottom line. Anything that leads you away from Jesus Amen. is destruction. It's very simple. Anything that is pulling you away from God and his desire in your heart can lead to ruin and destruction. And I want to be very clear. Entertainment is not wrong. You know, I don't want you to leave here thinking like, oh, I can't do anything, you know, like fun or, you know, that, I mean, if you know anything about my family, that is not my family. We do all kinds of fun and crazy things and all that kind of stuff. Yesterday, we rode on a mechanical bull and, and Rachel threw an ax at it. I mean, we had fun. Not me. Did I not make that clear? She didn't throw an ax at me. She threw it at a wood wall. Um, but anyway, we do a lot of fun things. Those aren't wrong. It's not. All of those things are good if we're doing them for the glory of God. You know, if we're doing them like with, with God right there, you know, seeking after him, you know, wanting to live a life that's pleasing to him. It's not like we need to stay away from those things. So please don't like misunderstand that I'm saying like all this stuff is like sin and horrible and wrong. And, and that's not true. God wants us to, en to enjoy the, the good things of this life with him, not to spite him. You see, and that's the difference that I really want us to be able to focus on here. <clears throat> in, uh, we go on in uh, the church of Laodicea in um, verse 18, and Jesus has the solution to their problem. 
It says, I counsel you to buy for me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Does anybody want to take a guess as to what made Laodicea so wealthy? Gold, fabric or garments, and eye salve that they use for medicinal purposes. Okay, So Jesus gets right to like, this is your problem, but I have something better for you. Because the first thing he says is like, you know, you want to become rich, but I have something better. Gold refined in the fire. In 1 Peter 1, 7, it says, These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. You know, Jesus is saying like, you're going after gold. You're going after the wealth of the city but I have something better. I have something better for you. I have something that's faith, that's not going to fall away, that's not going to be lost so easily. It's going to last for eternity. You know, seek after the gold, the, the faith that Christ can offer. Don't seek after, you know, to build up your bank account, to build up your money, to, to make more. Don't make that your focus. Make what Jesus can offer your focus and what your heart is truly longing for. And then Jesus talks about how, you know, uh, where is it? White clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. And the best thing I could think of is Adam and Eve in the garden. When they had sinned, what was the first thing that they noticed about themselves? Naked. We're naked. And they felt shame for it. And, Jesus, and God came into the garden and he's like, he made them clothes to wear. But now that, that was like a temporary worldly clothes that they, could, that they could wear in the garden of Eden. Jesus has something even better for us because we still have that shame for sin. But Jesus is saying, I have something, I have white clothes for you to wear. And what he's telling us is I can take it all away. All your sin, every wrong thing that you've done, I can just take it away. And he's like, I have these white clothes for you. Take them. Wear them. You know, I want to make you clean. I want to make you pure. In Colossians 1.22, it says, But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Doesn't that sound good? Because, you see, we don't forget our sins, do we? We don't forget our wrongs. But Jesus is saying, like, you come to me, and it's God. You are going to be holy, blemish without blemish, free from accusation as you stand before God. You see, this is something that, that the church of Laodicea, they were like, oh, we, we make these amazing fabrics. It was actually like a black goat's wool or something like that that was really like important in, the, in those times. And Jesus is saying, I've got white garments for you to wear. I've got something that's going to take away every shameful thing that you've ever done. You will feel no shame anymore because you will be holy and pure in the sight of God. And then finally, Jesus said he wanted to help them to see. And I think it's just simply to see the truth, to see their need for Jesus, to see the things from, from God's perspective. Remember, like I said, like to realize that like without Jesus, you're wretched, you're pitiful, you're poor, you've got nothing. And he wanted their eyes to be open to see the truth, to see how that they needed Jesus, that they needed to come to him and to be with him. And then we go on in Revelations. And in verse 19, it says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. And this is what I love about this uh, verse is Jesus isn't just like, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. Adios. Jesus is like, I have a solution. We can fix this. Everybody that's here today, Jesus can fix what you're carrying. You are not lost. You know, you are not so far gone. You are not so far in the hole. You know, Jesus already called them wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked. And he's saying like, we can fix that. Jesus can fix whatever you brought in today in your life. And what he's saying is, um, repent. You know, repent of it and come to me. Stop acting like you don't need Jesus and go to him. 
And then Jesus makes this amazing offer. In Revelations 3.20, he says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat uh, with that, that person and they with me. Do you realize this is like savior of the world? You know, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's standing at the door and knocking. What an amazing picture of how much Jesus wants you. We don't deserve this. We do not deserve this verse. But yet, Jesus is coming after us. And here's one. It's interesting. Have you ever read a verse so many times and then something's like, whoa. Yeah. I, for some reason, it never dawned on me. And Because it, it says, if anyone hears my voice, for some reason, that never registered with me. It's not like he's just like, he's calling out. He wants us to hear. He's like knocking urgently. And you know, if, if we go back to the previous verse, it's like he's saying like, you know, he's knocking while going, repent, repent. I've got something so much better for you. You know, I have gold that's been refined. I have white clothes to cover you. I have salve to put on your eyes. Just open the door and sit with me. It reminds me of like, and I, I think I told this story before of how I was grilling on an afternoon and put the ashes in the trash can. And that evening, um, our trash can started on fire. And the neighbor ran up to our door. And do you think he just went? No. He was calling out. He's like, fire, fire. And he was pounding on the door. I think that's how much Jesus wants you. Jesus wants you to sit with him. It's an amazing offer that a lot of times we don't fully grasp. He wants you just to open the door. Let him into your life and sit with him. Spend time with him. It's so easy in our lives to get busy. It's like, you know, our alarm clocks are like a, a starter's pistol at a, at a race. It goes off and it's like the day gets going and we're off. And we're flying through the day. And we've got this to do and that to do and all these things. That, and we're getting busy. And then when we have uh, some downtime, we're like, oh, well, I want to go do this and this and this and this. Someone's knocking at your door. Are you taking the time to let Jesus in and sit with him? And just to have that fellowship with him. Allow him to do the work that he needs to do in your life. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, it says, oh, sorry, it says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You see, in our lives, we're chasing, 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 and it gets tiring. Because it's like Jim Kelly, that quarterback, who had achieved everything, but he didn't have rest. He didn't really have anything, he realized. And what he, we all need to come to the point is the, uh, what Jesus is offering us is so far beyond what we could ever imagine. And so many of us here today are chasing after the pleasures like the church of Laodicea. You're chasing after all these other things, thinking like, that's how I'm going to get filled. That's what I need in my life. If I could just, if I could just, if I could just, if I could just. All you need to do Answer the door. Open it up. Let Jesus eat with you, to sit with you, to talk with you, to fellowship with you. <clears throat> and Jesus said, you're not going to leave too, are you? How do you answer that today? If Jesus came here and, and asked each one of us, are you going to leave or are you going to come with me? All of us would say we're going to go with him, right? Right? Is that what your life looks like? Tomorrow morning, you know what your day is going to look like. Is Jesus part of that day? Are you sitting down? Are you sharing with him? Are you fellowshipping with, fellowshipping with him? You know, is he part of your life? Are you going to wake up tomorrow morning and say, Jesus, I need you? 
Or are you going to go through the day like what you really need is your job, your work, your family, your friends, whatever it may be. And my prayer as, as I was preparing this is just simply that your cry of your heart would be, Lord, to whom shall I go? Let's bow our heads. I want to take a little bit of time here. I want you just to, to offer yourself before God. I want you to truly, like, just like put your life before him. And I want you to honestly pray and see God for a moment and just be like, Lord, am I sitting with you? Are you part of my life? Or are there things in your life that, that you're chasing after that you shouldn't be? And we're just going to have a, a moment of silence where I just want you to, to seek after him and let him work in your heart and, and to truly reveal what needs to change? And is that fellowship with Jesus a priority to you? Lord, I just want to pray that as we leave here today, Lord, that you would continue to work in all of our hearts and all of our lives, Lord. Lord, we desperately need you. And Lord, I just pray that we would come to a place that each person here would truly wake up tomorrow and be able to say, where would I go, Lord? You are the one that I need. Lord, help us to be fully committed to you, to not be sidetracked by the temporary pleasures of this world, Lord, but that we would be fully committed to striving after you, that you would be our priority, our, the first thing that we think of when we wake up, the last thing we think of when we go to sleep, Lord. And that we would just commune with you throughout the day, Lord. Lord, I just pray a blessing over this congregation. Lord, that we would rise up and become the people of God that you have created us to be. Lord, that we would use the freedom that we have in this country to seek after you and not to build up our own kingdom, Lord. Lord, I just pray that you would to create within each person here to be a mighty warrior for your kingdom, fully and completely committed to you, Lord, that you would uh, teach us and train us and, and change us to have the full armor of God, Lord, so that we can go forward in this world and make a difference for what truly matters, which was your kingdom. And Lord, I just pray your blessing upon each one of us, Lord. In your name we pray. I hope you've enjoyed this. To hear other messages, go to facebook.com forward slash GCF Church or youtube.com forward slash GCF Church. You may also follow Georgetown Christian Fellowship with our app. Go to either iOS or the Play Store for Android and search for Word Server. That's one word, Word Server and install the free application. There you will get all of our messages, including streaming capabilities.